hello, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, happy birthday, Samson. So I am one of the probably two people here from Trinity College Dublin, uh, where I came to get to know you more in the recent years that I've been there. And of course, I have learned a lot from you. And I also probably owe to you a lot in terms of support, especially in solving our two-body problem. Uh, so, uh, with that, let me also thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak and apologize that I'm not going to, my topic is not on, uh, uh, neither on anomalies nor on integrability, although maybe some of the structure could have something to do, could have some elements of integrability per se. So, a uh, so uh, the title is CFT and black holes and it's maybe m much more catchy than what we're actually going to see. We are not going to see much of black holes here, but we're going to see some elements of them. Or uh, let's say we start our baby steps uh, in this direction. So, so where does this uh, whole talk fit into? So <coughs> It starts from the holographic principle, the idea of the correspondence that tells us that we have some quantum field theories and they are, have equivalent description in terms of uh, gravity in ADS space. And uh, given the recent advances in uh, techniques in conformal field theories, for which some of the people here are <laughs> uh, experts and pioneered them, uh, we would like to use them to deconstruct, in a sense, the holographic principle and learn more about gravity. So what kind of questions we would like to ask in general is what type of theories have gravity description, what restrictions you can impose by physical consistency conditions, and more specifically about black holes, can we learn something by studying conformal field theories? And here I'm merely thinking of higher dimensional conformal field theories. And of course, several more questions. So, so in this talk, we are going to discuss what we call holographic conformal field theories. And by that, I, I don't uh, mean theories that have an explicit holographic dual, but theories that have certain characteristics that we come to acknowledge as such that give us an equivalent local gravitational description in terms of Einstein gravity, actually. So these are large n or large c, where c is the parameter that defines the two-point function of the stress-energy tensor in the CFT, uh, conformal field theories, which also have an infinite gap in the spectrum of operators which have, of primary operators, which have spin higher than two. So there's been a lot of progress in studying such theories, and uh, one of the, uh, perhaps uh, basic work that sparked this whole initiative, this whole approach, was the work by Hemskirk, Penedones, Polchinski and Sully, where it was first uh, shown, or depending on your level of, uh, you know, rigorous, uh, your desire of rigorousness in proof, <laughs> uh, they have shown that uh, by studying the crossing equation, that uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, local couplings in gravity and uh, solutions to the crossing equation or B coefficients. So furthermore, several, uh, several works followed that try to use consistency conditions and principles like unitarity or causality, which uh, uh, showed that basically this the, the couplings that are not uh, present in Einstein gravity lead to several various inconsistencies. And uh, so, so these are some of the things that historically have uh, brought uh, us into, into where we are today and we would like to go beyond that and study many things. But at the same time now we are using, we are, we are using this, uh, all these techniques in order, for example, one approach would be to study, try to compute Feynman diagrams in gravity by using uh, conformal field theory techniques. And of course, there are many, many other topics, but the topic that, as, you, as I alluded to at the from the title, that interests me are black hole and black hole physics. Obviously, this is quite uh, further from where we stand at the moment, and uh, if we would like to understand them, well, the first thing that we want to do is perhaps see how, uh, in some sense, emerge 
uh, when we study conformal field theory. So we would like to see some uh, elements of uh, black hole physics that show up in uh, conformal field theory correlation functions. So one standard approach to study, to study that to start, for example, looking at this would be to study uh, thermal correlators. Because we know from, our, uh, from the holographic principle and the IDSFT correspondence that when we want to study uh, uh, CFT at finite temperature, we can equivalently look in the large N and large soft coupling limit in the, uh, for the theory in uh, uh, ADS virtual black hole. So, uh, and we can study correlation functions from there. However, this, uh, th there has been uh, some approach and there's some work in this direction, but the work that I will present here follows a slightly different uh, route. Uh, it uses the fact that uh, we can look of the theory, we can understand possibly several aspects uh, of the same physics by looking at different correlation functions. Uh, since we, ha we are interested in theories at large n or large central charge, we expect this, we understand this in some sense like a thermodynamic limit for our system where we have a large number of degrees of freedom. And in that sense, we can may try to address the system by studying correlation functions which involve two heavy operators that will effectively produce for us our thermal uh, background. So these operators are termed heavy because in the limit where we send the central charge to infinity, their conformal dimension also scales the same way and the ratio delta heavy over C is roughly fixed. So in the dual gravitational description, the parameter that we're going to see a lot and it's equivalent basically to delta heavy over C is the ratio of the uh, horizon radius to the ADS radius that's in four dimensions specifically this equation since it will be mainly the focus of this talk although there are results beyond that. Uh, and you can get to this relation through the uh, ADS safety correspondence. So this will be an important parameter for us here. So what is the correlator that, we'll, uh, uh, that we will focus on in this talk is basically a correlation, uh, the four-point correlation function. The first perhaps non-trivial step we can take, we can look at uh, two heavy operators and two light operators and they're all going to be scalar operators for simplicity and we expect that this will be more or less equivalent to a thermal uh, CFT two-point function of light scalar operators. So uh, we know from experience from our holographic duality that in fact uh, uh, this object is, cannot be analytically computed beyond, for example, cases in ADS-3. And uh, so you would wonder how much mileage can we get, how far can we go by looking perhaps at an equivalent description in CFT. And uh, well, what we can do so far is approach the problem in several kinematical regimes that make it a bit more tractable. And these are mainly two so far that we have looked at. Uh, one of them is uh, denoted by regio or a cona limit, and the other is the light cone limit. So let me say a few words about the first that uh, unfortunately I'm not have time to discuss in this talk. So in this limit, this is basically uh, the technical uh, definition of the limit, let's say, in terms of the CFT correlation function, which implies that you have to do a certain analytic continuation. You're always looking at Minkowski correlator, and you want to take both of Z and Z bar going to one, which correspond to the conformal cross ratios, with this ratio fixed. Uh, so th in this limit, what we can do is we, ca we expect to get from this uh, four-point correlation function or rather from this equivalent, uh, basically the scattering phase shift of a particle that is affected as traveling along an null geodesic by the presence of the black hole, which we expect to be like a particle of a very large mass. So this is physically the limit that uh, one is interested in there. And uh, this is uh, a work that we have been doing with uh, Yim Tseng Ng, Parna Andrei Parnachev, Robin Carlson and Petra Tadic, two of our students. And there is also a, a contemporary work also by Fitzpatrick, Huang Li and Li as well. So 
Unfortunately, I will not have time to discuss this. There are a lot of subtleties there, mainly in how one can define uh, the classical phase shift from the gravitational description. But what our focus on is in a much uh, simpler case, in the what is called the light cone limit, where in terms of the cross ratios, we have both z and z bar smaller than one. The, uh, the two operators are such that they are, uh, the distance is space-like and gradually approach uh, the point where the distance between them becomes null. And in this case, there was, uh, there is uh, like a wealth of results and it seems like a lot of information we can extract from this correlator in that limit. Unfortunately, this doesn't have a clear, let's say, scattering picture interpretation that you would like to, okay? So, so this is basically the outline of a talk. There'll be some safety basics, but rather probably I will skip them in this audience. We don't really <laughs> need any safety basics. And start from defining what is a holographic CFT, what are basic our assumptions, and then how we'll try to address the computation of this heavy, heavy light light correlator. So let me uh, skip all this. Uh, uh, generalities, uh, this is the crossing equation, okay, and let me go to the holographic CFTs. So uh, to examine CFTs which have a holographic description, as we said at the beginning, we define them in a sense, we, we, we will uh, assume that they have a stress energy tensor operator and that there exist also two large parameters in our system. We have a large number of degrees of freedom. Here I call it n, effectively is the square root of the central charge of the, uh, the parameter that sits in the two-point function of the stress energy tensor and that there's also this characteristic scale that separates the spectrum of operators of spin two and higher for primary reasons and uh, lower. So in general, we, call we use the terminology of the uh, gauge theories, but here we don't have in mind any specific Lagrangian for our CFT. So we will think of a single trace primaries, like a set of primaries that uh, we are, are given in our theory and can have uh, uh, spin up to two with uh, celebrated stress energy tensor. And then double trace and multi trace primaries are composite operators that we can build from this original building blocks that our theory has. Uh, so in general, this would be uh, the, the rules that we are going to be interested in. So when we have, this is of order one in the large central charge, a large number of degrees of freedom limit. And uh, these are like M2 double trace operators, oper oper schematical primaries uh, that can be uh, composite primaries of this form where both operators are the same. Now, when we have two scalar operators, say one with M2, but M2 is, uh, uh, depends on two, well, that's probably on two different operators, then the correlation function behaves like one over N squared. When uh, the, the composite operator is made out of these two operators here that we have, then it's of order one. And in general, when we see the stress tensor in the middle with two some other light operators that behaves like one over N. So uh, these are enough for what we're going to discuss here. And we generally will also assume that the conformal dimension of the light operators is not an integer because there are complications that show up in that case. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to consider this correlator and uh, we'll try to study the crossing equation uh, order by order in this parameter mu that we defined and in the light cone limit, where in this uh, definition corresponds to z bar, one minus z bar, z bar going to one. So note that in effect, what this does is allow us to study what we would call the stress tensor sector of the correlator. We'll see that a little bit more explicitly later. And this is because effectively the parameter mu counts how many stress tensors appear uh, within our correlation functions. 
So whatever I will say today can apply more generally. So it's uh, what we're going to discuss is the stress tensor sector in a sense of this correlation function, but the same sector is true and valid in terms of OP coefficients and so on and so forth for a correlation function of all light operators. So, uh, so what is the method we said? We study by crossing, so we'll study the contributions in both what we call T and S channel and just to set the notation here by T channel I mean when I bring the operators that are identical to each other together and by S channel when I bring the operators that are not identical to each other together. So let's start from the T channel which is a little bit easier but that's where the stress tensor sector sits and we'll be interested in it. So if we expand it, uh, if, we, if you use the OP expansion to write our correlation function in terms of T channel we, uh, we have this uh, G which denotes the blocks and P the product of OP coefficients of our operators and here by S and T I denote the spin and the twist of the operators that contribute in this generically infinite sum. So now we are, we are saying that we are going to study the correlator in some kinematic regime. This kinematic regime is the light cone limit and in this case we see that the specific blocks behave like this. What I mean that they behave is that this is the leading term in an expansion in 1 minus z bar of the conformal blocks that we have. So uh, this leading term basically tells us that uh, the most important contribution to this infinite sum uh, of, uh, for, uh, for the correlation function comes from operators of the smallest twist. Uh, also note here that what f is is basically something like a product of a hypergeometric function that depends on twist and the spin because we are going to see a lot of this f function later. So, so let's start our analysis step by step. We start from the first step which is like the identity operator. This is what gives us the disconnected correlation function correlator where we have like product of two point functions of heavy and light. Here we don't see any dependence in mu in this parameter that we introduced. Now let's see what happens at the next step. So now uh, in, in uh, next we have to discuss what would be, uh, be, be uh, after twist zero what is the lowest test operator and because of the unitarity conditions that uh, 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 that primary operator satisfying conformal field theory, this leaves us to consider conserved currents and perhaps some, some extra scalars beyond those. So uh, uh, thinking of like a most generic situation we can have, like a most generic CFT, we're going to consider a stress tensor and assume that there are no other conserved currents in our theory. So in this case, because of a word identity, we can see that the product of OPE coefficients that accompany the conformal block in this infinite sum come are proportional to this parameter mu that I discussed from the beginning of this talk and will be the main, uh, uh, an, an important uh, aspect of this. So now you can say, okay, definitely if we can have the stress tensor, we can think of a theory that doesn't have other symmetries, no other concept currents, but what about other scalar operators? In general, if there are no symmetries, there wouldn't be any reason for other scalar operators, even if they have lower twist than the stress energy tensor, to have an OPE coefficient that scales with mu. So that's why I discussed before that we are going to effectively focus on the stress tensor sector of the correlator. But of course, since we are setting the rules of the game, we can also say we assume that there is no other uh, contribution. So let's see what happens later. Basically, what, what we can see is that uh, this uh, product that the correlator admits an expansion in powers of mu in the T channel and uh, uh, that goes also for the OP coefficients. And what exactly do we have? So at order mu, let's say we focus on the stress tensor sector which comes with a uh, factor of mu. At order mu squared, what we see is that we can uh, make composites 
of two stress tensors and several derivatives in between. You can obviously think of other composites where you have, where you can also take, uh, have some contraction so that uh, uh, Laplacian shows up or contracts several of the indices of one stress tensor with the other. But in this case, the twist is higher than this object without contraction. So th from the class of this multiple, how I will call the multi-stress tensor operators that we have, this, uh, 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 this correspond to the minimum twist uh, multi-stress tensor operators. They will uh, so now we see that the parameter mu will accompany uh, the number of mu that we have tells us how many stress tensors sit within uh, a composite operator that we have. And also, given that we're looking at the light cone limit, we are allowed to focus on a specific set of all these composite operators. However, still this does not simplify a lot of our work. Let's look at order mu squared. So before at order mu, you, we could say, okay, we had just one operator uh, that was uh, giving us the lowest twist, maybe some scalar, or we can say that the ROP coefficients in our theory are zero, we can throw them away. But at order mu squared here, we see that we have basically an infinite sum of operators because no, many, uh, no matter how many derivatives we put here, still the twist remains to be equal to 4. Sorry, Manel, what's the actual reason and why, are you, uh, why you, are not, you are keeping just the, the straight derivative, no, no Laplacians or something in between? Uh, exactly what I said. So if you, if you introduce, you'll get higher conformal dimension, and therefore the twist will be uh, higher. So it won't be a lowest twist operator, no. Actually, we'll see in, in our recent work, maybe at the end I will say a few words that we can consider those as well. But which expansion are you doing? Are you doing an expansion in Lycon or in 1 over C? It's not here, the commuter, I don't know. In 1 minus the bar, in Lycon. It's the, Lycon is the smallest parameter? It's even smaller than 1 over C? 1 over? C? Ah, no, no. First, so first I take a C large, and then I take mu, and then I take 1 minus z. But then we'll see that basically I can define a parameter mu times 1 minus z bar, yeah. which uh, controls basically the, the yeah. summation. If you want to expand the mu, that presumably you can even do it away from the light cone, because the expansion parameter is mu times 1 minus z. What's the actual expansion? Yeah, the, the po point is what contributes. Okay. So the light cone tells me that I have lowest twist. Uh, maybe, I, did I answer the question? I yeah, maybe you're right. Uh, so, so let's focus on order mu squared and try to see how we can resum basically these infinite contributions. But in order to resum them, we have to know what are the OPE coefficients for these operators. We know that they come with an overall factor of mu squared, but at the time, uh, now the way I present the story is basically historically, in the way actually we computed that, now we have many ways of computing these OPE coefficients. Uh, at the time, we didn't know the OP coefficients. The only thing that existed in the literature were just a few of them, like a handful of them, computed in gravity by some uh, similar expansion of the two-point function. And, but what we knew was that uh, they all seem to have a structure of this form where this is the, uh, uh, the, the uh, conformal dimension of the light operator, and these uh, numbers A, B, and C depend obviously on the spin of the operator that we consider, since we have operators of the same twist but different spin. So the question was, what were these functions? Could we basically, these parameters, can we write a generic formula for them so that we can perhaps afterwards be able to sum this infinite contribution and see what it gives us at order mu squared in our correlator, and then whether we can actually evaluate the sums. So once we have that, the sums will be over some f functions, which are just some hypergeometric. So 
we were actually able to find this uh, OP coefficients with a little bit of guesswork and a little bit of looking at the other channel, at the S channel uh, behavior. And the first thing that uh, helped us was the fact that we knew that in gravity, when we have a large uh, delta light now, afterwards, we can take large delta light, we see that we can compute the two-point function of the, this operator. Remember, it's a, a two-point function at a thermal background. We can compute it through the black hole calculation by some geodesic computation. So this is the geodesic, say, computation. You can do some regularization that doesn't, that's not important. But let's suppose now that we, this is the result in ADS, let's suppose now that we expand in the parameter mu that uh, has the mass of the black hole inherent in it. The first term will be the usual one that has information from the stress tensor sector, from the stress tensor itself. And the second term we see that the term that is the highest with delta L, comes basically from the, from the leading term because of the exponentiation. So that basically tells us that whatever this AS parameter is, is such that when we do the sum, what we get should be the light cone block, let's say, of the stress tensor squared. And that's, and looking at identities for hypergeometric function, you can explicitly find what AS has to be in terms of the spin. Is this a guess or...? Uh... Well, by now it has, it's uh, checked with Laurentian version formula, it's checked with cross-channel uh, calculation, so it's, now we can extract it. I'm just going through, let's say, the way we found it. And at the beginning we found it a little bit uh, with a bit of guesswork, let's say. But under which assumptions? Because you said, are you aiming for gravity or using gravity as an input? So, he, so here I had to, so I didn't have these OP coefficients and I would want ideally to have them or compute them in the CFT and get this result that will aim, give me gravity. Now I didn't have that so I tried to guess, go my way around it with whatever results I had. Now however we have tons of means to compute them and I can say that we can compute them uh, from CFT alone using, for example, the Laurentian version formula. So, so that's what we use. Then we also use some information from the S-channel computation. And let me just not bore you with the details of this computation. Just want to say that uh, uh, what, uh, what we see in the S-channel is just all these double trace operators that are made out of heavy and light. And the only thing that happens at each order in mu is that we get anomalous dimensions and OPE coefficients of these operators corrected compared to their uh, mean field theory result. So one can go ahead and try to study and uh, it was useful for us at the time to focus on the small z region on top of the light cone limit because there we had a little bit of moral control and allowed us to basically guess the other parameters that sit in the OPE coefficients. How does this work? You usually look at the uh, at you compute the correlator again in the S-channel at order mu, assuming you have some corrections in OP coefficients and anomalous dimensions, this you don't know but you can extract them from the stress tensor contribution in the T-channel and then when you're going at order mu squared, uh, everything that you're interested in comes at uh, terms of uh, uh, log squared and log where these pieces are the leading corrections at small z and these pieces are completely determined by the previous order data. So uh, uh, once we had the result, we could actually also check with the uh, regi limit because we had explicit results there. This would be the large impact parameter region of the regi limit and also it would be inverted in terms of how the limits are taken. Usually in the regi limit you first take sigma to zero and then uh, allow for fixed rho and then a large impact parameter you take rho large. Here we have first zooming in some sense in the light cone and then take sigma to zero. However, for several terms you can see exact matching. So now let's go, suppose we have these numbers, I don't write them as complicated but we have them and I can tell you we can compute them in thousands of ways by now, so we can establish, we can do a purely CFT calculation, let's do the summation. 
We can do the summation using other identities for hypergeometric functions that unfortunately we had to derive ourselves because although they're simple, they didn't exist in the literature. And what we get is the following result. So this factor comes from the light cone expansion and accompanies factors of mu squared. This overall term is just the, the disconnected correlator. And this is the result that we see at order mu squared. So we see that we have three terms. Each of them depends on these functions f, which are proportional to hypergeometrics. And in front of them, there are parameters that depend on delta light. Obviously, this is the highest term that comes from stress tensor squared. So what is the interesting observation here? It's like a trivial observation. But however, it uh, gave us a lot of mileage. It's that f3 squared is 3 plus 3 is 6, 2 plus 4 is 6, 1 plus 5 is 6. So what does this mean? So we thought, OK, let's see, would that mean something? Let's go to order mu cube. Let's now use an ansatz for the result of the correlator. And using this ansatz, extract these coefficients. So let's assume that at order mu cube, the contribution of the stress tensor sector looks like this. So it contains all the possible products of th three f functions that we can have. And their sum should go to one because uh, to nine because we have f3 cube. And f3, remember, is always the conformal block of the stress tensor sector in the light cone limit. So we use this ansatz. And by solving the crossing equation, we were able actually to see that it's true and, that, and determine explicitly these coefficients. However, there was a slight disappointment in the fact that we noticed that this sort of hypergeometric functions are not really a true basis of something. Some of them were not independent from the other. And you would say, how on earth would you think of such a thing? Uh, the reason we thought of that is because we actually had, by chance, observed a similar thing happening in two dimensions. So in two dimensions, uh, the heavy, heavy light light block is known. It exponentiates. There is a very clear, uh, uh, simple form. And uh, in that case, you can expand this in terms of z. And you see the following. That's now notice uh, the function that sits in the exponent, not the full correlator, although for that is the same as well. And what you see is indeed that you have a similar structure. But now, of course, you have the function f, the hypergeometric uh, corresponds to f2, because this is what gives you the stress tensor. So having this in mind is what led us to conjecture that something like that will happen in, in four dimensions and actually higher. And here I'm just writing the conjecture that the stress tensor sector of this heavy, heavy, light, light correlator, and I would perhaps uh, remove the heavy, heavy, light, light, is just the stress tensor sector of any four-point correlator in the large and large lamp, uh, delta gap limit should be given in term, should be expanded in powers of mu. And at each order in mu to the k, you will have a sum of products of f functions where the there will be a k such functions at, at order mu k, and their sum should be equal to 3, to three times k. Why do you take z bar to 1? So this is uh, what I mean by that is that this is the leading term in the correlator, the one that corresponds to the light cone limit, because I have neglected contributions of uh, multiple stress tensors that have a uh, higher twist. So this is exact in mu? Uh, yeah, as a sum, it would be exact in mu. If I could resum this, yeah, it would be exact in mu. And uh, of course, that's what you, what you would actually hope for, given that you know that something like that happens in two dimensions. But unfortunately, although I was hoping that I would have to report on that, we don't have a finite, uh, we don't have a sum yet. So what we have shown since then is that we can consistently use such an, an answer up to, I don't know, how, no matter, whatever higher order 
you want to check, I mean, you can do it uh, computationally in a computer and you see up to order mu k and this answer satisfies the crossing equation is a consistent result. And from that, you can extract OP coefficients at higher orders in mu at for these multi-stress tensor operators that you can then also cross-check with the ones you can get from the Laurentian inversion formula. So uh, what else? Uh, uh, now actually we have checked that and uh, we have also determined the coefficients and we established that at least to each order up to mu to the 6 that we can compute, this correlation function, this sector exponentiates in the same sense that it happens for the Virazoro case. So what I mean is that the structure in terms of f functions that show up in the whole correlator persists in the, exponent, in the exponent of an exponential. And I can write my ex exponent in this form. So maybe I will uh, finish probably a little bit earlier. So uh, the question is basically what underlies the structure? And unfortunately, we don't know yet. It would be much help to understand why something like that can be even done in two dimensions. Does it mean something? Uh, one uh, point is, uh, then the question is, can we resum the series? And as I said, unfortunately, we're not able to have a result as far. But what we thought of, obviously, was the following. Beyond the pure Virazoro, we also have uh, higher spin cases with W3, W4, and higher algeb algebras. And for W3, uh, the corresponding global block is F3. Is this function that is now in four dimensions, the global block of the stress tensor, is the one of the spin-3 current in, uh, in two dimensions. So the question is, is it perhaps that? If you try to resum, uh, the, in that case, you know, people have also computed the analog of the Virazoro vacuum block for the W3. And from there, you can take a limit where you scale uh, the spin-3 charge with a central charge. And that allows you to uh, have only the spin-3 charge at order mu and then combinations of that at higher orders. But what happens is that there is a term missing. So it's not the answer that we want. It's very close. So let me just show you. At order uh, mu squared, the uh, W3 uh, block will have a term that goes like F3 squared and a term that goes like F2, F4, but does not have a term that goes like F1, F5. Another piece of information is that this term is crucial to get the scattering phase shift correctly. So now another uh, question is what happens when delta light is an integer? I didn't say anything specific to that, but some of you may have noticed that this uh, OPE coefficients that are wrote schematically have uh, a denominator that it's equal to delta L minus 2. And you wouldn't expect, obviously, to have any divergence here. What happens is that when the light scalar has dimension equal to 2, there are composite scalar operators which contribute to the same order in the light con limit with a uh, multi-stress tensor operator and you have to solve some mixing problem in order to determine the OPE coefficients. So that has not been done yet. Now another question is whether you can go beyond the light cone limit. So what I mean by that is we computed the leading term in the expansion of z bar going to 1. What about the subleading or sub subleading or how does it work? What you have to do is add now, consider uh, other operators that contribute together with the lowest twist operator. And uh, these operators are the ones that uh, you can have contractions either, either between derivatives or between the stress tensors themselves. And they obviously increase the twist. So this is work that is going to show up soon. We were able to actually consider such contributions, find the corresponding OP coefficients, in several subleading orders in the slide cone limit. And what we determine is that, uh, it's okay, maybe I should make a parenthesis here. So 
One interesting aspect of this whole discussion is that you, we were able to compute the stress tensor or P coefficients exactly, and they didn't depend on the details of the theory. For example, there was never any uh, occurrence of other parameters that normally appear in the three-point function of the, stress tens uh, of the stress tensor, like the A conformal anomaly coefficient. So that could well have uh, been included in this, but somehow the leading light cone, the multi-stress tensor sector, is independent of that, and it's the same for uh, the uh, results for all the cases. However, what you see as you go to subleading orders, you see these terms infiltrate and possibly spoiling this sort of universality, as we can call it. And what, uh, what is really uh, interesting here is that you can basically determine and s prove that everything is universal, all this contribution, except for those that have total spin equal to zero or two. Remember that in the T-channel only even spin contributes. For, so from spin 4 and higher, all this multi-trace, multi-stress tensor sector is fixed and universal, but spin 0 and spin 4 contributions are not. So, and then, so up to now I have only focused on the stress tensor sector of the correlator. Obviously, this is a program and uh, wants us to push it further and maybe after Possibly we are able to resum this, consider, uh, check if we can consider quasi-normal modes or go beyond the large C, address generally physics close to the horizon. That is possible probably due to the fact that we have like two competing limits that we can look at, both the regel limit and the light cone limits. We can extract results. So thank you very much for your attention. So the, 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 I understood that this approach you have that works in principle for any dimension. Ah, yes, yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to mention this. So we have checked uh, several even dimensionality what cases about, uh, and, they, and they work, but in all dimensionality CFTs that let's say that would correspond to ADS4, things were not as simple. So we, we have we have we have tried to uh, consistently get an answer, but not yet. So I don't want to say. So the problem is that, uh, for example, one immediate issue is that um, uh, these these blocks are these hypergeometrics in even dimensions that give us the block are uh, basic algebraic functions. That's not true in the other case. And then it's also the fact that you have possibly to consider half integer values and different mixings, and that makes things a little bit complicated. Thank you for the question. Questions? Yes, uh, <coughs> Can you, uh, with these techniques, uh, do the kind of thing that Amati Chaparron Veneziano did, which is ultra energy and gravitational scattering of light states? But the ultra energy large S makes a large mass, and therefore. Yeah, that is the, a little bit further away from the moment, but that's one thing that we are interested in doing. So this, so this stress tensor sector are co uh, contributions at different uh, orders in one over n, basically. So forget mu; it's like one over n squared, one over n four. So that ba effectively tells us that we have a sector of several diagrams that could contribute in the process and we can possibly resum that. So uh, once that is done, then I could say that maybe we can approach this problem uh, if the kinematic regime allows us to concentrate just on this. We probably need some extra scalar contributions, that's my feeling, but yes. You, you didn't mention the comparison with ideas. Mm -hmm. Can you mention if it works or is that? Ah, yeah, so, so, so there's one to one. Okay. You get the same infinite sum of hypergeometrics in India? Yes, yes, yes. No, well, I suppose we should continue the discussion with Manuela over coffee. Thank you.